All right, welcome back. <laughs> so we're going to discuss, this is our last session. Last but not least, usually it's the best. <laughs> we save yeah, the best for last. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about regional anesthesia, but it is very special because we're going to talk about regional anesthesia in pediatric patients. And for this, we will have two prominent speakers. The first one is Dr. Luke Tillens from the Netherlands. And the second speaker is Dr. Philip Rapp from Australia. As for this session, it will be led by Dr. Christopher Kapuangan from Indonesia. Please, Dr. Christopher. Okay, thank you, Krisha. Is my voice can be here good enough? Yes, very clear. Okay, good afternoon to all my participants, my anesthesiologist colleague. Welcome to Indo Anesthesia Symposium. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you for Indo Anesthesia Committee, for uh, Dr. Susilo and Dr. Eddy and uh, friends uh, who made this international level symposium available online. We hope once this pandemic is over, we can meet each other again uh, on offline. So this afternoon, it is my pleasure to become a moderator for the last session of the day. We hope all the participants still have their energy to join until we finish, as this is the last topic, but it is very interesting. So. Uh, we are going to talk about the regional anesthesia in pediatric. As we know that in adult, regional anesthesia is improving very fast because the demand of post-operative comfort is increasing. This is also happens in pediatric population. So this is the interesting topic. One of the most common technique in pediatric regional anesthesia is caudal block, which will be elaborated by our distinguished speakers. So now we have we will have two presentations and followed by the discussion. So any you, any of you, all the participants who have questions, please put your question in QA section. So hopefully we have time to discuss all the questions later. Presentation. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the first speaker, Dr. Luke Tillens. I believe the, in the Netherlands, it's still the morning. Good morning, Luke. Dr. Luke comes from the Netherlands. He graduated from University of Nijmegen. And currently, he is a senior staff member of pediatric anesthesiologist at Nijmegen too. He's also the president of board of Dutch Association for Regional Anesthesia and members of many other organizations of which his competency is no doubt. So, Dr. Luke, the floor is yours. Your time is 30 minutes. Thank you. I will share my, I will share my uh, slides. Can you see them? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, yes, I'm Luke Tillens. Thank you very much for this kind introduction, Christopher. And, of course, thank you, Susilo, for singing this song for me because I love it. Knock, knock, knock on heaven's door. We don't want to do that yet. So we stay a little bit more here down on earth. Okay. So um, I'm the first speaker in this uh, session talking about ilioinguinal or caudal blocks for hernia repair in children. Um, what do we need to talk about this? Well, start a little bit in the history. I like to talk a little bit in the history. And I found this, this article. I don't understand. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's not there. Wait, 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 wait. Here it is. In this article, it's in 1986, we can see irringual nerve blocks in children, and they compare caudal block with a new technique. And that new technique is actually an irringual block. And so the irringual block, as the conclusion is telling us, is learning us, is provide this useful alternative to caudal blocks. And now we are like 30 years later, we still discuss this subject. Which one of which technique should we use in children for a hernia repair? It's actually a continuous search 
for the best technique uh, to relieve our patient from pain. But these techniques need to be safe, low incidence of side effects, reliable, effective, adequate durations. And beside that, we want these techniques to be simple and without later complications. That's our search. That's always in, in, in medicine. We are looking and, and trying to find new ways of treating our patients the best possible, right? But since 30 years ago, until now, we are still discussing what is the best technique for hernia repair in children. Local anesthetic techniques should be more and more nowadays a supplement to general anesthesia and mostly done for post-operative pain management. So if you do these things, there are a few options for hernia repair. You can insulation into the wound, caudal anesthesia, or ileoingual iliohypogastric nerve blocks. Looking into the literature, we found that comparison between insulation and caudal blocks are actually the same. But this was before the ultrasound. And iliohypogastric hypogastric nerve blocks compared to insulation in the wound seems to be the same. Very old, way before the use of ultrasound. And in the history also, they compare the two local is hernia ileoingual block versus caudal. And then they see that they are actually only slightly different. The post-operative sprain scores are similar. Vomiting time to, to first ambulation and first urination, similar. Only the local anesthetic, the, the, the local uh, ileoingual block needs a little bit more acetaminophen compared to caudal block. But the ileoingual block, those, those patients can go back to home and leave hospital earlier than the ones that got a caudal because the caudal needs to be worked out, needs to be finished more or less before you can send the patient home. And that takes more time. So it's actually still more or less the same nowadays. So which technique we should choose is not is one technique better than the other, but is more because they are equally uh, giving pain relief for the patients. It depends nowadays more on safety of the procedure and the possible complications and or side effects that can occur in and with the technique in the patients. Talking about safety, talking about safety, these two articles, one in 1996, a very old one already, was very important in the development of using more and more local regional anesthesia techniques, especially for peripheral blocks. This first article from uh, Guillaume Frey from France uh, learned us that these peripheral techniques do have less complications. And if some complications occur, these complications are less uh, severe compared to the complications for central blocks. And then 14 years later, Geoffrey um, worked together with ECOFI and they found out more or less the same thing. We should change a little bit more from central blocks towards uh, peripheral blocks. But then the ultrasound starts to help us in this regional anesthesia techniques. And Suraj wrote in 2015 this article that tells us that the overall estimated incidence of complications after caudal blocks was just less than 2%. And he says that safety concerns should not be a barrier to the use of caudal blocks because it's such a low incidence of complications. And if we look at the complications and we look at other articles from, be, from before, then we see that the most common complication, or is it a side effect, is the, the incidence of urine retention, which is something we can't change by the use of ultrasound. So it is there. And then should we not do this block, yes or no? 
There is just one other study that surprised me, and that says that there is an incidence of self-limited back pain in children following caudal blocks. I was not aware of that, but it is transient and it goes away. So it's also not really a matter of, should I not do this block because of this? The safety of ilioinglial blocks, should I do an ilioinglial block? Well, as Frey and a coffee learned us that there are very few complications in peripheral blocks compared to central blocks. So this should actually help us to go and do more peripheral blocks. But are there some complications or side effects? Yes, it is reported from out of history that there is a failure rate for the ilioinguinal iliohypogastric block about 20 to 30%. And yes, there is a case report of a small bowel puncture, which is a horrible complication, of course, because the kid lost about 20 centimeters of his uh, intestinal gut. And there is an inadverted femoral block in 8.8%. So you need to explain the parents that sometimes the kid cannot walk directly because one of his legs will not move that good. So he can fall on the ground. So you, they need to guide him if he goes to the toilet and they can't step out of the bed just, that, just like that. So this is, these are some complications. Are they severe to not do this block? Well, let's see what happens. The ultrasound starts to be a very important tool in our techniques and it's the first article about the use of ultrasound in ilioinguinal iliohypogastric blocks. It's from Wilske Marhofer um, the, and Capral, the first starters, the godfathers of the use of ultrasound in regional anesthesia. And they told, uh, learned us that about 100 children, they did the block and the conclusion was, this is giving us a much higher success rate with even less volume of local anesthetics, so with less complications of intoxication. They did the next year another study and they learned us that we could even use up to 0.075 ml per kilogram to make a sufficient effective ilioinguinal block in children. That means if the kit is 10 kilograms, you only need three quarters of a milliliter and not even one milliliter, and you will have a good block. So that's very, very low volume that you can use because of the use of ultrasound, because you can put your needle that close to the place where you want to inject your local anesthetic. The ultrasound learned us other things in the ilioinguinal blocks. One doctor is uh, performing the block, and the other doctor is taking the ultrasound and is watching where it did this local anesthetic go. And then they learned that only 14% of the blocks was in the correct place. But luckily, when the injection was a little bit too deep in the transverse abdominal muscle or a little bit undeep in the internal oblique muscle, the major part of these injections still gave a block. But this blind technique and the use of ultrasound to see what we actually did gives us the understanding why 20 to 30 percent of our blocks were failed because we were not deep enough or we were too deep with a blind technique. Also, the ultrasound learned us that, OK, if we are injecting in the right place, which is in the plane between internal oblique muscle and transverse abdominal muscle, then there are the vessels too. So we inject quite close to the vessels. So what happens with the central system absorption of our local anesthetic? And then they saw that exactly if you use ultrasound, the absorption in the central system, in the central compartment is much quicker and a little bit higher than in landmark based. But is this a problem if I only put 0.75 ml in a 10 kilogram kit? I can put much more without being afraid for intoxications. So still the level is a little bit higher, but it's still way below toxic levels. Then the ultrasound learned us a few years later 
you even don't have to find your nerves in your image. You need to find the right plane. So this was the beginning to go to plane uh, 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 ultrasound techniques. And they wrote, uh, Ford wrote that if you find the plane, 100% the nerves will be there. One problem you don't talk about is if you do plane techniques, you need volume. And in kids, this volume might be a problem for toxicity, but still you don't need that much of volume. In 2016, new articles came and they learned those different anatomy where we should put our local anesthetic, where we can find the nerves better. And the old technique is telling us that we go from the iliac spine, one or two centimeters medial, one or two centimeters down, and we put the injection here. Can you see my, my, my arrow on the, on, the, on the image? But nowadays we go up the ridge, we see not only internal muscle and transverse muscle, but we let go open a little bit the external oblique muscle, which is lower only upper neurosa. So if you put your probe exactly on the spinelia anterior spine, then you will see two layers, but a little bit higher, you will see three layers and you will see the nerves much better. And you will see that the vessels are walking more medially farther, further away from your injection place. So this injection place is much better, but this injection place is that far away from where the femoral nerve is passing through the abdominal wall that with this technique, we don't see femoral nerve blocks anymore. So the use of some increases the block success rate. And the user of the visualized the needle position in the real time anatomy so there are no intra abdominal needle placements needed in the right hands doing the right technique. And the ultrasound reduces the volume, and the new anatomic knowledge changed the place for injection so there are less femoral blocks. So the complications are increased enormously by the use of the ultrasound in ilioinguinal blocks. And so one year ago, tw 2020, this study came and compared again the installation and ilioinguinal iliohypogastric block. And the conclusion is, oh, sorry, didn't appear. The conclusion is that there is definitely more advantage in doing an ilioinguinal iliohypogastric block compared to wound installation. So this is what ultrasound changed. This discussion we have left already because we know definitely now that you should do a reason anesthesia technique instead of an installation. Other things we learned is this new anatomy about uh, the L1, L2, the iliohypogastric nerve, which is not only from L1, but also from T12. That's important for the next speaker, I think, because it's about the caudal block. If I want to block the ilioinguinal block more peripherally, it doesn't matter where it came from. If I block it peripherally, I will block the nerve and I will release the pain. But if I do a central block and I think it's only L1 that is giving his roots to the ilioinguinal iliohypogastric block, which you want to block, also in a caudal block, of course, then you should know that you should read T12. For example, this study says that, let's see if we do them together, a caudal block and an ilioinguinal block, what happens? And then they said, yes, if we do a caudal block first and then underneath the block, we do an ilioinguinal block, then in the end, this ilioinguinal block is helpful compared to only the caudal block. But what they did was something very strange. What they did was they used buprenorphine 0.7 milligrams per kilogram. And I always learned by the formula of Hamitrage, by the godfather, Dr. Dahlens from France, which has wrote the first very thick, thick book about reason anesthesia and kids, learned that you need to do at least one ml to reach T12 L1. So I'm afraid that a lot of these blocks didn't reach L1 or even T12, so that a little, a, a, a few or, or quite a lot of these blocks didn't work 
properly. So yes, an Ely Ingo block add to this technique would be nice. But then you do two techniques and you have two risks in the same kit. And it's all about this risk. It's all about the safety. When are we going to be safe in children? And is that to be peripheral or is it caudal also good? And is it really true that those both techniques are equally releasing the pain? Or is there more? As this always continuing search for the, the, the better techniques, yes, maybe there are other blocks to find out. There is an article from 2020 and that says, let's see a quadrats Lamborn block. And they learned that the quadrats Lamborn block gives a much more pain relief. Wow, wow. It says a number of patients require spots of oral acetaminophen a little bit more. That's the same as the article in 1983 telling us that if you do an ileoinguial block compared to caudal block, yes, the ileoinguial block needs a little bit more acetaminophen in the past. That's the same as when they compared it 10 years later. Yes, they need a little bit more acetaminophen, but you can send them earlier home. So this block doesn't change the situation between caudal or ileum world. Then it would be caudal or quadrasum bone, or then it would be quadrasum bone or ileum wheel. Another thing, compare a tab block, a quadrasum bone block with an ileum wheel block. It says quadrasum bone block provides a prolonged period of analgesia and leads to a decrease of opium consumption compared to tab blocks and ileum wheel herb nerve block children and then I was reading and think, okay, this is from this year. And it says opium consumption. We never give our patients that after an ileoingual block and a hernia repair, morphine. It's just paracetamol in an enzyme. That's it. That's helpful. After a caudal, it's the same story. So we never use opioids. To, to, to give pain release in these children. So I don't know what they really did, but they said, okay, this quadratum bone would be helpful and would be maybe better. Another po possibility is they did a retrolaminaire block to compare versus the ileoingual nerve block. And the conclusion is, yes, the retrolaminaire block is superior to ileoingual block in providing post op analgesia and pediatric patients. Okay. But is it really, really, really much better? It's not really much better. But what is the problem? Sorry, sorry, sorry. What is the problem is that oh, there is nothing there. Okay, we are looking for the best techniques, and these techniques should be safe, low incidence of side effects, reliable, effective, adequate duration. Are those new blocks doing that? We don't know because they are so new. We only use them or a few in the world use them for hernia repair. But on the other hand, the technique should be simple. Retrolaminaire block is described. They have to put the patients in prone position, do the block and change the patient another way. Is that simple compared to ileoingual block where the patient can just lay in uh, the, the normal position in the, in the back uh, lane position instead of prone position, supine uh, position. I think with the very small possible advantage in pain relief, it doesn't make sense to make, to do these kind of new blocks compared to using the caudal or the ileoingual block which are proven to be sufficiently good in hernia repair in children. So my conclusion is, yes, regional anesthesia techniques are an extremely important part of pediatric anesthesia care. And with the right knowledge and experience, I think both techniques can be effective and safe in children. Although, of course, pediatric anesthesia still is very dangerous. Thanks for your attention.
giving the floor back to Christopher. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Luyuk, for your excellent presentation. I'm sure many of us will benefit from it. And again, if any of the audience have uh, any questions or case to discuss about, please write them on the Q&A question section and we will discuss them together after the second session. So moving right along, uh, we have Dr. Philip Rapp. Uh, good evening, Dr. Philip. If I don't mistaken, in Melbourne is already uh, what uh, eight or nine o'clock in the evening. That's right. Let me write his short bio first. Dr. Philip is the deputy director of anesthesia and pain management at the Royal Children's Hospital Melbourne. He is also an associate professor with the University of Melbourne and a research associate with the Murdoch Children Research Institute. He has more than 30 years experience as a clinical pediatric anesthetist. So we hope we can learn many from his presentation today. So Dr. Phillips, you have 30 minutes, please. Thank you very much, Christopher. Um, and while I'm loading my talk, which I hope you can all see. Yeah. Yes, we can uh, see. Just, uh, uh, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Cecilio, uh, Dr. Eddie, um, for the kind invitation to speak tonight. Um, the, uh, I'd also like to thank um, Professor Jeff Frawley, who's a, a member of my own department, who's done a huge amount of literature re research on this topic and uh, helped with the presentation. Salamat sore kawan kawan, Dari Melbourne. I did actually study Indonesian for about six years and I, I toyed with the idea of giving a little introduction uh, in Bahasa Indonesian. Um, but unfortunately, uh, I would have to say in the last 20 years, my vocabulary is uh, hanya sedikit. So uh, I won't torture you all. Uh, the rest of this lecture will be in English. Um, if any of you post COVID have the opportunity to come to Melbourne, there's lots for you to do. And uh, it's a, an exciting place where we have all sorts of activities. Uh, and down in the bottom left corner here, you can see we do actually do a little bit of work occasionally as well. Sorry. My talk today is on caudal anesthesia. And as Luke has already alluded to, there's been a, a huge interest in pain relief in children. And this is one of the reasons they're so important. In the last few years, we've also had some excellent pharmacokinetic data being published. And you're all aware, increased concerns about neurotoxicity using general anesthesia, which has made a bit of a swing back to regional anesthesia and a big interest in that area. Uh, and as Luke has already alluded to, caudals are effective and easy to learn, um, hence the other big interest. Today, I'll talk a little bit about the practical aspects of caudals in children, um, why we choose them, what operations we choose to do with them, the anatomy, the techniques, including a bit of ultrasound, training and equipment, complications, adjuvants, and some conclusions. I'd like to start with the history of caudals. Uh, the first significant publication was in 1933 uh, by Meredith Campbell, uh, where she described the use of caudals in children uh, in urology. And certainly urology is still a major area where caudals are used um, because it's lower abdominal. And today it's estimated that 25% of pediatric surgery uses regional blocks. And one third of these regional techniques, in fact, are caudals, as we've heard from the ADARPEF publication, the French Language Society of Pediatric Anesthesiologists. What about at my institution? Uh, some of you will know of the famous Kester Brown, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, he was the director of our department for nearly 40 years. Um, and back in the 1970s, uh, in his early days, we were doing about 100 caudals a year. And that has exponentially increased over the decades. So in 80s, 200, 90s, 400. Currently at the Royal Children's, we do about 24 and a half thousand cases a year and at least 1,000 caudals. So 
I estimate that means we've got an experience of over 25,000 quartals in our institution alone. And what do we use them for? Well, we did an audit a couple of years ago where we looked at the, um, the neuroaxial blocks that we put in. As you can see, quartals are the largest percentage of those, 869 quartals. And they were mainly used for general anesthesia, that is uh, operation, so for, sorry, for general surgical procedures, that is operations below the umbilicus. So hernia repair, orchidopexy, operations on the perineum, circumcisions, et cetera or orthopedic procedures, which were lower limb procedures, um, fractures, dressings, uh, et cetera. Um, but as you can see also, a, a spattering of epidural use and spinals as well. Interesting, if, if you look at the graph on the left, that shows the age distribution and caudals are mainly used in the younger patients. That is birth to uh, five years of age, a little bit above that as well. And that's mainly because of the motor block um, that you will necessarily get with a caudal um, and our reluctance to send day cases home with weakness of the legs, et cetera. What are the contraindications to caudal? Um, well, there aren't that many really. Um, local site infection, so an abscess over the area that you want to put a, uh, the needle. Um, spinal cord abnormalities, such as tethering of the spinal cord. A coagulopathy, uh, which would increase the risk of a hematoma. Uh, and, and the most important one being the parent, um, or if it's an older child, refusing uh, to allow you to do it. Um, now, interestingly, ultrasound, as Luke's talked about, and MRI have changed some of these contraindications. And we probably now are more likely to put caudals in with minor spinal cord abnormalities, knowing what the anatomy is via MRI or, or ultrasound. There'd be no talk about caudals without talking about the anatomy. And those of, the, those of you that do them uh, will realise that the anatomy is incredibly variable. Um, in general, the cephalic end of the sacral hiatus is at about S4 in about a third of patients, but there's lots of variations. The apex can be at S2 in a quarter of the patients. The canal can be open. And Trotter published this in 1947 with a fantastic review of the variations in uh, caudal anatomy. As a general rule, the dura ends at, at S23, making it a relatively safe procedure, but obviously that will be a normal distribution. So occasionally it will come down a little bit lower. So if you're putting your needle in at S45, occasionally the dura will be quite close to your needle and you do get the odd uh, dural tap. As a general rule, the AP depth of the sacral canal is between two millimetres and a centimetre. And a study done on 36 patients, um, 36 adult patients, showed that the mean volume of the sacral canal is about 14 mils in an adult and obviously less than a child. To access the caudal, uh, for, uh, for caudal block, it's usually done in the lateral position and the epidural space is entered via the sacral hiatus. Difficulties will include uh, having thick cornea, which are hard to palpate, or older children having an ossified sacrococcygeal membrane and difficulty piercing the sacrococcygeal membrane. But a great study by a uh, German study by Schuppler in 2000, where they had, he, he had 32 inexperienced residents uh, that were uh, shown how to do caudal blocks. And after 32 blocks, they could achieve an 80% success rate. Uh, and so this wasn't trained anesthesiologists, this was inexperienced residents. So it is a, relatively easy to learn. But while we're on that, I will caution you about the learning curve. Um, and some of you may be aware about this um, psychological um, graph um, called the Dunning-Kruger effect, where on the left-hand side of the x-axis, um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, where we're young and silly, uh, but full of confidence. Um, we will sort of embrace these techniques and jump into them thinking we know how to do it. This will be fine. Our confidence is incredibly high. We don't know very much. And very quickly, we realize that actually, I'm not having as much success as Dr. Cecilio or Dr. Eddie. Um, I'm having a few more complications and suddenly we fall down this big slippery slope into the valley of despair 
when we realize that actually we don't know as much as we thought. And it's only with training, supervision, a lot more education, a lot more oversight that we slowly, slowly get back to uh, a point where we have sustainable long-term success. It's a very fascinating learning curve, and I'm sure we can all apply this to lots and lots of things we do. And I, su I suspect it applies to regional anesthesia far more than general anesthesia. The usual technique for inserting a cordial in a child is the landmark technique. Um, it's usually done in the lateral position. The hips and knees are usually flexed. Um, commonly, we identify the posterior superior iliac spines, and I'm not sure if you can see it on this little diagram, but the little dimples, the posterior superior iliac spines, and the lines between those, Tuffy, is, uh, is the base of an equilateral triangle to the sacral cornua. And if you palpate those sacral, sacral cornua, between those cornua lies the sacrococcygeal membrane, and this is the entry to the epidural space, which is just under that membrane. And that's, that's the classic landmark technique. I, I will caution you that the sacral hiatus is a little higher than you think in babies. So, uh, and it's because everything's a little bit higher. Tuffier's line's a little bit higher. Um, this, the cornua sit a little bit higher. Sometimes the sacrum's a little bit more open. So don't be surprised if it's uh, a little bit higher than the natal cleft. That's quite common in small babies. Can we improve the success of just the classic landmark technique? Well, there've been a few publications looking at ways of improving it. Uh, in 1992, Lewis in anesthesia published the WUSH test where he put a stethoscope just proximal to the needle and injected two mils of air and could claim that he could hear uh, a whoosh sound if it was successfully placed into the caudal canal. Uh, unfortunately, this re resulted in a little bit of hemodynamic instability in a few children. And so a modification of that technique was published sometime later called the swoosh test, where fluid was injected, that is local anesthesia or saline, probably local anesthesia is a better choice, um, in the British Journal of Anesthesia. And that had fewer hemodynamic problems and was just as successful. Now, Luke will be pleased to know that there's also been an explosion uh, of use of ultrasound um, for caudals. Um, and in fact, there are some situations where it's almost mandatory. Um, some malformations, epispadius, hyperspadius, if you had an abnormal, known abnormal spinal cord, abnormal landmarks, the caudal, uh, uh, caudal ultrasound is a very, very useful and very successful technique. And there have been some recent publications showing that the success rate uh, in both inexperienced and experienced operators using uh, ultrasound is higher. Interestingly, though, there has not been any published, published paper yet to show that morbidity is decreased using ultrasound. So success rate might be higher, but morbidity hasn't been shown to be any different. What different techniques can we use for caudals? We did an audit in our institution, which really surprised me. Um, traditionally, we'd used a hollow needle technique um, through, the, uh, through the sacrococcygeal membrane. Um, but increasingly, we've got a younger population of consultants who uh, are using cannulae. I suspect it's because they've been trained in Europe, a lot of them. Um, and so we had a fairly high incidence of uh, consultants and uh, trainees who used a cannula. Uh, nearly 70%. Um, a few people use a, you'd styletted needles, the argument being that you don't want to uh, put a little epidermoid um, bolus uh, in, into, the, uh, into the canal. Um, but they've, apart from the odd case report, there's been very, very little reported um, morbidity associated with that. Uh, the size of the device, as you'd expect, a small needle was the most common. So a 22 gauge cannula or a 23 gauge needle was the most commonly used. What volumes of local anaesthetics do we use for caudals? Uh, Luke has already talked about the famous paper by Armitage where he, um, uh, common, where he described the volume required to achieve a dermatomal block. And if you want to do a uh, saddle block that is only cover the sacral segments 
uh, and some of the lumber use 0.5 mils per kilo. If you want to do a hernia repair though, you will need to use at least a mil per kilogram to get up to the T10 level and uh, cover the T11, 12 that's required. If you go a little higher than that, 1.5 mils per kilo, you can get up to the mid thoracic area. There have been other tech, uh, techniques described for estimating the volume of local anesthetic required based on uh, calculating a volume per segments block. So you work out how many um, dermatomes you want to cover. And Busoni described a volume according to the number of segments you wanted to cover. And Spiegel also had a formula where he looked at the length uh, of the spinal canal um, from the spinous process of C7 to the sacral hiatus and had a formula added to that. I don't think anyone uses Busoni or Spiegel's formula in our institution. I think we all use Armitage because it's simple, it's easy, and it just works. It's fail safe. Um, and if, in fact, when we looked at uh, the volumes required um, to get adequate surgical anesthesia in the graph on the right, uh, one mil per kilo uh, was almost had an, an almost 80% or an over 80% success rate uh, as an appropriate volume for the surgery that was being done. What drugs do we use? Well, we classically use longer acting drugs in our caudal, uh, caudal blocks. I guess if we're going to bother to do a caudal block with the potential risks, we want the analgesia to last as long as possible. And classically, we use bupivacaine, levobupivacaine or ropivacaine. And most of us will limit our dose to less than 2.5 milligrams per kilogram to reduce the, the likelihood of toxicity uh, in case we had high intravascular absorption or in fact, an, uh, an intravascular injection. And so this equates to about a mil per kilo of the 0.25% solution uh, or 0.5 mils per kilo of the 0.5% solution. And these would be fairly standard local anesthetic doses. This has been looked at. Um, the Pediatric Regional Anesthesia Network in 2020 um, reviewed over 14,000 cases. Um, they showed a, with a mean uh, bupivacaine equivalent dose of about 1.3 to 2 milligrams per kilogram. Um, so with, within the tox, toxicity limits that we just dis discussed. And um, they did note that there was 113 patients in that review that did receive a large dose greater than 3 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and some of these received fairly high concentrations. Um, but their conclusion from this review was that the site impacts the dose more than age, weight, or local anaesthetic used. And I think we'd agree. We've had a fair bit of experience with caudal levobupivacaine in our institution. George Chalkiartis uh, published in the BJA in 2005 uh, some pharmacokinetic data um, what we do know about levobupivacaine from the uh, two major studies on this drug are uh, that the CMAX and the, uh, the, the CMAX is quite acceptable. The TMAX is quite delayed in infants under three months. And we think that's probably because of reduced absorption and clearance. Um, and in fact, Cortinez's uh, paper um, had 20% higher doses than Chalky Artis. Um, and so that explains the higher plasma levels. But as you can see, they're acceptably uh, low plasma concentrations um, with, with those dose regimes. Now, what about adding additives to caudal drugs? I, uh, I saw, saw there was a question for Luke um, in the chat about uh, uh, adjuncts for uh, ileoinguinal blocks. And similarly, there have been questions about adjuncts to caudal uh, local anesthetic blocks. The only reason for adding an adjunct, I would, I would say, is to increase the duration of the block, but they're not without their risks. And there are quite a few unresolved issues here. First is the potential neurotoxicity of any drug that we add to um, the, neuro, the neuro axis. Um, also, it's an unlicensed route of administration for a lot of drugs. So a lot of the drugs are only licensed for intravenous use, not for spinal or epidural or caudal use. Um, we don't know the long-term safety of a lot of spinal analgesic agents in children. And with this increasing look at the incidence of neurotoxicity, 
um, where we are still concerned that there may be some neurotoxic effects of anything that we add to the caudal canal. Um, not to mention how dangerous are preservatives. So there's ongoing debate about whether adjuvants really add enough clinical benefit for the slight increase in duration we get. Um, Sue Ellen Walker, who was a member of our department before she uh, went to Great Ormond Street, um, published a lovely paper uh, on the um, preclinical strategies for the development of safety and efficacy. Um, and uh, she, she plotted a therapeutic ratio of analgesia to toxicity. Um, and interestingly, with morphine, that ratio is quite high. Um, with clonidine, it's actually quite high as well. Ketamine, borderline, um, and a, a lot of other drugs. It, a lot of other drugs, you know, clearly will be looked at. Um, but her conclusion was, if several drugs produce a similar therapeutic endpoint, choose the drug that's le least likely to cause neurotoxicity. And I think that's good advice. So, in summary of the additives, then, just to summarise all the literature, um, I think there's reasonable acceptance that clonidine, one to two micrograms per kilogram is an acceptable drug. It will increase the risk of apnea if you're uh, quite a small neonate, small infant. Dexmedetomidine, one to two mics per kilo. Opioids, I think, have been commonly used, but we would advise against fentanyl and sufentanyl, the more lipid-soluble uh, opiates. And preservative-free ketamine and S-ketamine seems to be reasonably safe uh, without the risk of the toxicity from the preservative. Um, and the, um, the European Society, um, uh, in a consensus statement, um, came, came out with these recommendations. Now, back to safety. And, uh, and Luke talked a bit about the safety of regional blocks and, uh, and caudals. And um, there will be a little bit of overlap of some of, some of the stuff he mentioned. But the French Language Society of Pediatric Anesthesia in 1996 published their first big review. Um, uh, 47 centres uh, uh, across Europe and 85,000 procedures. 50% of those of the regional blocks were caudals and they only had 23 complications, 0.9 in 1,000. Um, quite reassuring. Um, and those complications included things like accidentally penetrating the dura, um, intravascular injection, um, technical problems, failures, skin lesion, um, you know, um, post-operative apneas. Um, none of them really significant, none of them very long lasting. And they repeated this study uh, a few years later uh, with much bigger numbers. Interestingly, a smaller percentage of caudal blocks and a much higher percentage of peripheral blocks um, which would, you know, support Luke's idea that the that people were swinging swinging towards uh, the more successful regional blocks, um, but similarly had a fairly low incidence of complications. They did note though that the neuroaxial blocks are six times more likely to have complications than the more peripheral blocks, um, even though the complication rate is low. Um, now, it wasn't just the French language societies that, that, that has looked at this. A UK epidural audit of over 10,000 children um, looked at 921 caudals. They had one significant um, incident, and that was a quarter equina syndrome that persisted for 12 months. But they had no other local anaesthetic toxicity, nerve injuries, or inadvertent spinals and, and, uh, or infection. And the Pediatric Regional Anesthesia Network, this huge network across the United States, founded in 2007, which has now looked at thousands and thousands of regional blocks. Um, first looked at 14,000 in 2007 and 10, uh, had no deaths and no serious complications. Um, and um, their more recent update has, uh, has supported this as well. So, and we're looking at big, big numbers, um, including um, look, looking at some of, the, some of the things that people do whether adrenaline test doses is useful. Um, interestingly, 95% of the techniques used, even in this recent audit, were surface landmark techniques and not um, ultrasound uh, assisted. What about locally? We've had very few complications with caudals in Australia. Uh, in 2002, there was a very unfortunate six-month-old child 
who'd had previous GAs and castings, had a caudal, was unstable hemodynamically, went to ICU. Uh, an epidural hematoma was diagnosed on MRI and the child was found incidentally to be hemophiliac, but no one had known that before that period. So an, a, an, a very unfortunate complication of an unknown coagulopathy. Uh, and that child, unfortunately, has, uh, has um, not made a great recovery. Uh, in, in the, at the Children's Hospital in Melbourne, we've had one neuropathic pain related to uh, a nerve injury after caudal anesthesia that was published in 2008. And we had another interesting child who got a neuropathy from the sciatic nerve due to being immobilised too long after a caudal. So the caudal was... Um, was the cause of a sciatic nerve neuropathy because the patient uh, had adequate analgesia and numbness. Um, so yeah, so, so so they do occur, um, and but in over twenty five thousand, you know, very low incidence. To summarise the complications we see with caudals and and their percentage incidence, they are quite low. And the highest complication with a caudal is failure. Um, 172 and 6, there's a 2.8% rate of failure. And the other complications, whilst a little bit annoying, usually don't result in any long-term sequelae. So if you get a dural puncture, as long as it's observed, uh, an intravascular injection, as long as it doesn't cause a local, serious local anaesthetic toxicity or hemodynamics, uh, hemodynamic side effects uh, are very low incidence complications. Just to challenge a bit of orthodoxy, um, while we're talking about caudals, what about doing them awake um, and avoiding the uh, potential risks of general anesthesia that we know in the very small babies? Um, that's certainly um, been discussed. It's certainly been done historically. Uh, There's a very historical photograph of a child having a lower abdominal procedure, a baby having a lower abdominal procedure with an awake caudal. And a study in 2007 published in the European Journal of Anesthesiology where they looked at 20 infants, 14 of them premature, who uh, had a one mil per kilogram 0.3% ropivacaine awake caudal um, for low, minor lower abdominal surgery. Um, interestingly, they had a failure rate of 20%. So one was converted to a general anesthesia and three required a bit of ketamine sedation because the, the baby was moving excessively. Um, but as you'd expect, at an onset time of about 16 minutes, um, they had a few intraoperative uh, apneas, which would probably be explained by the gestation of the babies. Um, but they had no intraoperative hypotension. And uh, the NEARS, the near infrared spectrometry on all these babies um, was satisfactory and in fact increased after they'd had their caudal block. So uh, exciting um, sort of area that we, that we don't, we haven't em embarked on uh, very much, but we might start looking at. It's interesting, there are a lot of regional techniques that we offer to adults that we don't offer to children, um, not for any good reason, Bit, bit, uh, probably a bit historical, but a bit, uh, a bit because we just assume that the children don't want to be awake <laughs> in the operating theatre. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say the caudals are one of the commonest blocks we do in children, and that hasn't changed over the years. And in fact, in our institution, uh, the number of caudals being, uh, being inserted has either plateaued or slightly increased. We know they're effective. Um, we know that with good training, good supervision, um, you, you can get sustainable, high percentage uh, effective blocks. Um, and we know from several hundred thousand studies now uh, and case reports that they are safe. Tarema Kasi Banya. Okay, thank you, Dr. Philip Rapp, what a wonderful sharing for us. Thank you for, very much for making time out of your busy schedule, of course. So now let us start the discussions. I already have, we already have many questions here. Some of them are quite similar. So we will try to compile first to Dr. Luke. Uh, for the first question, uh, 
what's the dose and concentration for ileoinguinal block? Uh, did you use it? Maybe. Uh, I use nowadays ropivacaine, and we have ropivacaine 0.2 or 0.75. So what I do actually is I dilute the 0 0.75, uh, 50 by 50 with some uh, silane, and I get 0 0.375. And that's what I use. And we use, like we said, in children for around 10 kilograms, I use one maximum of two milliliters in the ultrasound guided illuminating wheel block. So that is way below um, the toxic dose for sure. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, please. Uh, Chris, yeah, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I do a lot of ileoinguinal blocks without ultrasound. And uh, to answer that question about dose, uh, I use the highest concentration I can use, um, but stay within a safe uh, milligram per kilogram dosage. And because I put the block in at three levels, deep to internal oblique, between internal and external oblique, and superficially, I need about two to three mils for each level. So I need about six to eight mils. So, um, so I use the highest concentration I can use. So as Luke said, if I had a 10 kilogram one-year-old, I know I can use probably almost 0.5%. And if I had a much older... 30 kilogram six-year-old, um, then, then yeah, well, sorry, then I can absolutely use the higher concentration. So, but if I had a smaller baby, I might have to dilute down to 0 0.2, 0 0.25% because I've, I'm mindful of the toxicity. So, so, so as high a concentration as you can use staying below the two milligrams per kilogram. So you have to take it account too, uh, if you do the uni unilateral or bilateral, right? For the Correct. most of the, the local yes. anesthetic toxicity, yeah. Yeah, you must you must think about your total local anesthetic dose. Oh, we okay. in pediatric anesthesia we use in a, in in regional anesthesia almost always up till the toxic levels in children. So be very aware of the fact that what we inject is mostly up till almost toxic doses, and so you should count out before you inject anything, the total amount you are allowed of this dilution to inject in this kid. So if you count out, this is the total volume and you have two sides to do, the half is for yes. one side. Yeah. You have to divide it and you have to count out before you start. This is maximum for this kid. So I yeah, can use- I completely agree. Yep. Yeah. So I hope we, uh, this is uh, the, answer for this question. Uh, any question uh, about ileoinguinal block is uh, any experience, both of you uh, do the ileoinguinal block for obese children? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Uh, we I are... don't know, with, with, with ultrasound or without ultrasound? Please. I use only, only and for everything ultrasound. The ultrasound is, is stick in my hands. It's there okay. and it doesn't go away if I'm in the hospital, more or less. Everybody knows in my hospital, Oh, that's Dr. Thielens, and he has the ultrasound beside him. I yeah. love to work with the ultrasound, especially because you can lower the dose very, very much and very easy. In a base oh. kit, the problem is that the abdominal uh, uh, wall, the, the fat is, is, is hanging over the place you want to uh, put your probe. But you can uh, ask someone to help you and just hold away, just hold away the, the, the mass of fat, and you can easily reach the area where you will want to visualize the planes of the abdominal wall just above the iliac spine, yeah, the, the spina iliaca anterior superior. So even in, 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 in more um, uh, obese kids and also in obese adults, you just can hold, someone hold it. And if you don't have anyone, you can do that with sticking plaster, with tape to, to keep the, the abdomen away. And then the, the spine, you almost always can feel. And so you just push the tissue a little bit away and you can put your probe there and you will find the abdominal layers and the right uh, injection point for the ileoingual hernia repair injection for the ileoingual block. I, I, I agree. I, I don't use ultrasound and 
uh, I, I still find it's not that difficult actually in the obese, in the obese children as well because the anterior superior iliac spine is your landmark and there's not a lot of fat over the anterior superior iliac spine. And because you're injecting very close to it, as Luke said, one or two centimetres medial and below, that area is a bit spared. And so they might be fat everywhere else, but where you want to put your needle, there's actually not a lot of fat or, or much less fat. So um, it's even without ultrasound, it's still a, it's not, not that difficult in obese children. Okay, thank you. I agree that uh, with uh, both of you that uh, we have uh, need some experience for the ilioinguinal hypogastric for, for do the blindly because uh, there is some risk if we do some blindly. I agree with Luke that nowadays we use ultrasound. Uh, maybe it's safety for us to do the any kind of block, including ilioinguinal ilio hypogastric with the ultrasound. Okay, for the next question is uh, uh, for both of you, uh, do you give some adjuvant besides anesthet anesthetic? Uh, and then uh, is it uh, routinely give opioid for your caudal anesthesia? Maybe we can put it together for the questions. So sure, I can start if you like. Um, not, we don't routinely. Um, use opiates for our caudals. Um, we did we did some work in our cardiac surgical patients, where we really did want to significantly increase the duration of our block, and we were concerned about that eight to ten hour period when the patients' general anaesthetic agents are wearing off, where they get a little bit reactive in the intensive care. So we've been we were adding. Um, 10 to 20 micrograms per, ki per kilogram or 10 to 20 micrograms of, uh, of morphine to our caudals. And we were finding that that was giving quite nice prolonged uh, analgesia. Um, there's a bit of variation in our department. Some, some of our um, uh, uh, patients that are likely to get muscle spasm after uh, osteotomies, so our cerebral palsy patients sometimes get clonidine put into their caudals. Um, but the problem with, add with additives to the caudal is it means if you then have to give systemic analgesics such as opiates, you've got the problem of the adjuvants in the caudal canal combining with the intravenous drugs and you just you increase the risk significantly of respiratory depression. So lately we've just becoming a bit more purist the caudal is for local anaesthetic only, and the intravenous is for the other drugs that you might need for the other complications. And so we've played a little bit, but um, not much. I agree with that. And for the peripheral block, for the ilioinguinal block, uh, P.A. Longfist and uh, George Ivani from Italy, P.A. Longfist from Sweden, did a lot of investigations about using adjuvants in pediatric reason anesthesia. Um, they did uh, uh, use different drugs. And finally, they find out that actually for caudals only the uh, clonidine might be useful with less um, uh, side effects than opioids or, or neostigmine or everything like that. But yeah. for the peripheral blocks, they just realized that maybe only clonidine can help, but they need to use a very high concentration. And then it's the same problem. If you put a quite high concentration somewhere locally, it becomes into, it absorbs, it will be absorbed into the uh, uh, central system and it might work here. So yeah. maybe if you want something to work here because the working mechanism is still unknown, it's not really known and uh, we actually should learn more before we use it. Now we inject it somewhere to let it work here, then you can better put it somewhere in that you exactly know how much is in the central system to work there, instead of putting it somewhere that you don't know how much is absorbing every minute or every hour until how many hours after your injection still will be in the central system. 
So my advice nowadays is in pure fill blocks, we never use adjuvants in the injection. If we want to prolong it with some clonidine, we put clonidine in the IV. If you want to use dexamethasone, you do it in your IV centrally. As Philip uh, uh, got said too, that in the canal, it's only for local anesthetic. In the IV, you can put whatever you want. Okay, thank you. So for the adjuvant, please, please be careful uh, with the, uh, if you want to do the uh, peripheral nerve block, right? Uh, because uh, we have to know the, the condition to the systemic reaction. If we do the, uh, we, we put the adjuvant to the, our peripheral nerve block. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't. I was reading the quest, next question. What, what was the question? Hello. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, from Udianto. Sorry. Uh, uh, for look in uh, your presentation, you never use narcotic for post-operative pain in children. Lateral herniotomy. Is it correct? Only use NSID and paracetamol with. Is it superior use caudal block or iliopinal and iliopogastric block for longest pain post-operative? Which one more posterior in our, your experience? Maybe uh, he's, he, he asked about uh, the block versus the IV uh, post-op uh, post pain management. Uh, yeah, uh, we only use um, uh, uh, paracetamol, acetaminophen, and some NSAIDs postoperatively in kids. The kids do have pain in the first uh, few hours, and the ileal block will cover the first few hours, as caudal blocks are doing the same. The only problem that I experienced is what is the surgeon doing? I have been in discussion with our surgeons that operate these kids. And a few of them are pulling very high the, um, the hernia sac out of the wound and then very high and lots of tension. Then they, they um, close it and they cut it and it goes inside the abdomen. These kids mostly have pain even directly after surgery in the recovery room because the ileoinguinal block is only abdominal wall block. It doesn't block the intestinal inside the visceral pain. So if the surgeon is making visceral pain by a lot of strength on the sac, on the um, peritoneum, this pain will be inside the abdomen. So I can touch the wound of these kids without any pain. But if you touch the belly itself and you push a little bit, they feel pain. Mm -hmm. And that is because the surgeons made it too tight with too much so there is a constantly pressure on the on the peritoneum so i ask my 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 surgeons do you really need to pull that much out of the wound and then cut it off or you just need to cut off the sac without too much tension and if they leave this tension if they keep it with less tension these kids are all pain free in recovery and doesn't need anything else is that your question, Anson? Yes. Is yes. That... yes uh, so, yes, uh, do a supine position. Ewing will always supine, never uh, on the side. That was the question. Oh, okay. Before. Okay. Yes. Um, for... Because I agree. I agree with that. And um, one of one of the good things about working in pediatrics is your surgeons are much more obedient and listen to us much more than the adult surgeons because they know that. They can get in a lot more trouble if they don't if they're not nice to us. Okay. So, um, so our surgeons are very gentle, and 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 I agree with Luke. We ne almost never have to use opiates after an ileoinguinal block. They work so well. Um, they last for at least two or three hours, and then the patient's pain is usually settled down, and they usually are comfortable with paracetamol or non-steroidals. And caudal's the same, obviously, but um, it's quite unusual to need opiates after a hernia repair. Okay. 
Uh, there is a question. I think it's quite interesting. Is there any limit of age to do caudal block in children according to ossified of sacral hiatus? Uh, good, very good question. No, there's no limit because of the anatomy. Um, they do become more difficult uh, as the child gets older, as as ossification of that sacrococcygeal membrane. And as I teach my trainees, what you're feeling at that level of the sacral hiatus is very different. You, the cornu, you, you, you often don't just feel independent cornua, you often feel like almost a shelf of bone. Um, but you can still often get underneath that little ossification of that little shelf. Um, and you can even, you can eat that, that even occurs before the age of 10 or certainly as teenagers. You could still do a caudal in those children. It's just technically a little bit more difficult. Um, the limitation for us with caudals is more to do with the side effects of the local anesthetic. Uh, most of our patients are day cases and I would be very reluctant to do a caudal in a child that's walking, especially if I didn't trust the parents to supervise that child closely. And so as a general rule, if I had a day case, I would not do a caudal over about the age of two um, if I thought I was going to block the lumbar segments and, uh, and leave the child with some residual leg weakness. But, yeah. but I'm happy to do a caudal in an inpatient up to any age. Okay, maybe maybe the matter is not the age, um, the, but the matter is the body weight itself, because uh, we have uh, target to do the the analgesia, uh, which is uh, with uh, thoracal twelve or higher than thoracal. We need some more uh, local anesthet anesthetics dose, right? Yes, it's it, that's a good point. It's it's a much more unpredictable formula in the yeah. older child. Armitage formula probably doesn't apply, you know, once you get over about eight or nine years of age. Um, and because the, the volume of the caudal canal is very variable. Um, so um, you can still do it. Um, what we tend to do in that age, as the child gets older, is put a more dilute solution with a slightly larger volume. Yes. And that, that way you're, you're not at the risk of toxicity and you can potentially push the block up a little bit higher. Okay, the next question is, uh, in larger children, age five or seven, I often found back pain was up. Any explanation or any tips how to prevent this? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, after not, order, yeah. Back pain yeah, that's not that's not something I've experienced, I must admit. Um, I presume it's due to it's it's pain at the uh, site of the injection of the needle. Um, uh, I guess I guess you could actually put local anaesthetic at the at the site of injection. Um, so either put a little dose into the skin before you actually put the needle through the membrane, or you could even use a topical local anaesthetic cream at that site. Um, but I must admit, I haven't found that to be a problem. Um, I, mean, I wonder if Luke has found an issue of back pain in the older children having caudals. No, I read this article and I was surprised to, uh, to, to read that there is uh, lower back pain after caudal injections. Um, my idea was that what is, what is the cause of this, this pain? Is it, and is it pain or what is it? A child below two, three, four years is not really uh, no. cooperative to, to, to argue with us what is the pain. And if they have some numbness, they might feel uncomfortable and cry if you touch it. And then they think, oh, I feel something, but what is it? And if mm -hmm. it's strange, then they can, it can be explained for us by, hey, there is a problem, maybe it's pain. You understand what I mean? So they describe there is a pain, but I was thinking, okay, it's difficult. If this person that is making the question is telling me that these five, six years kids, they have more often back pain, it's surprisingly for me. Mm. I never have heard about it. In I'm working already 20 years in pediatric anesthesia. 
I never heard after a caudal this 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 problem. Uh, Sorry. Lucky maybe. But... <laughs> okay. Uh, do you routinely insert urinary catheter when using morphine as caudal adjuvant? Any tips for caudal drugs in one day surgery setting? Um, no is the answer. I don't routinely put a uh, epidural catheter in. Um, I must admit, I have been surprised at how little urinary retention you get with a caudal. Um, I suspect the bladder of a, of a child can cope with six hours of retention. And then when the caudal wears off, they, they don't have an issue. Um, but no, we don't routinely put uh, epidural, uh, put uh, urinary catheters in, even when we use opiates. Um, and what was the part B of that question? Yeah. Our, our, our tips for day, day surgery. Yeah, my tips yeah. for day surgery is uh, only lim limit your caudals to perineal or uh, procedures that are only going to block the sacral segments. I'm yeah. very nervous about sending older children home with lumbar, lumbar leg weakness. I agree um, with you. In my practice, is if you use the lower concentration, uh, let's say if uh, the operation is circumcision, uh, we, we, we don't need to put some urinary catheter. No. Uh, maybe 0.25% uh, or below the 0.25. I think it's quite uh, safety enough to for setting the uh, one day surgery because almost we need, don't need uh, we, we didn't need to put some urinary catheter. Do you agree with it? The most countenance we do is in uh, pediatric urology. We yes. don't use often in the caudals, but all these kids do have a urine catheter postoperatively. Yeah, most yeah. Of them. Yeah. So if we want to use it, we could use it, and there will be a urine catheter. The most described complication of the use of opioids intracaudally is urine retention, right? Yeah. So that is a problem. But we don't use the morphine in the caudal area. So. Okay, there is a question from... Please, uh, Dr. Raihanita, you raise your hand. Uh, thank you, Dr. Christopher. I would like to ask to Dr. Luke or Dr. Rak uh, about, uh, do you have any experience with class in pediatric uh, um, patient uh, during the caudal or uh, ilioinguinal block? Because usually, uh, from my experience, I always do the uh, regional anesthesia with uh, general anesthesia, and it's very hard to recognize the uh, sign of uh, toxicity in the pediatric patient. Thank you, Dr. Christopher. INF, um, once seen a child awake with clonic tonic activity, thinking of an intoxication. But as I told uh, before, you should measure the amount you can inject in that child to never raise toxic amounts of your local anesthetic that you will use this day in this kit that's on your table to avoid last. I use a lot less than I might use because I use the ultrasound and I try to put as low volume as possible around the nerves that I want to block. So that is all to lower the incidence of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. This case was my third or my fourth tap block in children. And as Ivani, I had connections with Ivani talking about the amount of rope if I we could use in these small kids. And so I counted it out, I injected it, after surgery, the kid woke up and had some tonic clonic activities. I took a blood monster, a blood sample, put some propofol. The kid got relaxed, woke up five to 10 minutes later, and everything was gone. An hour later, we took another um, uh, blood analysis, and the concentration of local anesthetic after an hour was higher than in the first minutes after this tonic-clonic activities. 
So I learned that this was my first patient that I inject quite a lot of volume and had excitation of safeflurane by waking up, which mm. 30 40 percent of our babies have spines on their ECG when we use safeflurane. We don't see it that much, but sometimes you have it. And mm. I just had it in these patients where I just inject for my third time. Oh my God, we are going to do this new block. And it happens, but happy has <laughs> no last. So I have never a problem with last because it's in my mind always when doing blocks. Oh, the yeah. Irish call that Murphy's Law. Yeah. More or less. More or less. Yeah. Um, that's an excellent question. Excellent question. Um, the vast majority of the uh, regional techniques, caudals, Etc. Uh, are done in a wake in in children that are anaesthetized. Um, the, about the only regional technique we do in awake children, uh, uh, in the tiny babies, where we do spinals, awake spinals in the at risk baby who we're concerned about post op apnea. Um, but the one th there's a couple of things we do for caudals, uh, knowing that the patients under general anesthesia to limit our risk of toxicity. Uh, and, and one of them is we routinely put on an ECG because uh, it's been shown that the most sensitive marker of an intravascular injection is changes to the T waves. And so we routinely, when we're doing a caudal block, the patients under anesthesia, we would put an ECG on and we would watch the T waves as we're injecting. And we usually get our assistant uh, to keep an eye on the ECG because we're obviously concentrating on the technique. We've talked a lot about adding adrenaline to caudal blocks um, to uh, assist with the detection uh, of intravascular injection. And the literature is full of do not do that. It doesn't help you one bit. And we would 100% agree. And I saw Luke shaking his head as well. So I'm sure he agrees with me as well. It's a waste of time. But the ECG, a useful thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Nita, are you agree? No, totally agree, Dr. Christopher. Thank you very much. Yeah, so it's all about the monitoring uh, intraoperatively. We have to very careful with the dose of the lo our local anesthetics. And then we have to put some, all our monitoring device if we want to do the block, especially in neonate or such children. So any question, uh, the other question, very interesting case with awake caudal. Have you used this for circumcision maybe? For awake, uh, it's, it's, it's so difficult, yeah. Uh, how about uh, your op opinion, it, awake it, 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 Look, we, we had this discussion in our department the other day. Um, if we have an at-risk neonate, so a, uh, a, a very small premature baby who's very small for dates or has had a, a history of apneas or has significant cardiac morbidities that we're quite concerned about a general anaesthetic, we would routinely do those with an awake spinal. So we would give the baby a little sucrose to suck on. We turn them over, we stick a spinal in, usually a milligram per kilogram, and that works very, very well. There are a few issues. A spinal in a baby only lasts a bit over an hour. So yes, surgeons have to be quick. Uh, they wear off very quickly. But we've got one member of our department who's the head of our department, Ian McKenzie, um, some of you might know, and he doesn't do spinals. He does awake caudals. So he's the only one that does them. He does them exactly the same in the at-risk neonates. And so he puts a caudal block in these babies. It has the advantage that it lasts longer. So the surgeons can take longer. Uh, it has the other advantage that it gives you a predictable height. The disadvantage is the babies move because they don't have enough motor block. And so he has to take them to the bed and keep their legs really tight so that they don't flap around. Um, so it's, we don't love the technique. Ian McKenzie loves the technique, but we, and, he, and if he was here giving the lecture, he would say it was the best thing ever. <laughs> but, 
But uh, it, it, look, it, it has been done. Uh, we haven't done any significant lower abdominal surgery in awake babies, but it is a technique that you could do, definitely. We yes. have now done three babies, not with an awake caudal, but we did the caudal because of the duration of the surgery yeah. instead of the spine. Uh, and what we did is actually did the mask induction, put the IV, put the caudal, and stop with the mask uh, uh, ventilation and get back to spontaneous ventilation. And the kids are, um, uh, we used some marisalam, and then they sleep on that, having a caudal. And it worked. Uh, it worked. You've just reminded me. Um, uh, only the caudal. Finally, it's only the caudal. You understand yeah. what I mean? So put some sedation with safety frame to put the IV and the caudal. And underneath, there is some sedation. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I agree that uh, maybe if we want to do the awake uh, regional anesthesia in pediatric population, the choice is spinal, right? Uh, caudal, yeah, maybe yes, maybe no, but we if we talk about the onset of the the anesthesia uh, we prefer the spinal for the awake uh, regional anesthesia if there is some indication and for the population itself maybe not for uh, above the infant yeah or maybe neonate or infant is okay to awake regular anesthesia but uh, uh, older babies uh, i think it's very difficult to do the the regular anesthesia with the awake children, uh, especially caudal block. We have to wait the onset and then after that, uh, the motor, motor block is not so superior uh, because the local anesthetic concentration, we cannot do the, the 0.5 maybe or only 0.25 or 0.125. Or is, it, is, it, is it that? Is it, are you agree with the my yes, I do. Conclusion. You've just reminded me too. The other, the other technique that Jeff Frawley and I published quite a few years ago is a combined spinal and caudal technique. Yeah. So you have the advantages of the motor block with the spinal and the rapid onset, and you have the advantage then of the longer duration of the caudal. So we put a one milligram per kilogram of, it was bupivacaine in the spinal, and one milligram per kilogram of bupivacaine in the caudal, and uh, the combination worked really well. I'm not sure why we don't do that more often. Um, I think it's because we've told our surgeons they need to hurry up and finish the operation. Um, yes. And so, uh, so they've done what they've told. So we haven't needed it. Okay, uh, uh, let's see that if there is another question. Uh, I think there's enough for the question here. Uh, do we always have to identify frog eye sign using ultrasound for caudal? Maybe. Can I answer that? Yes. Yes. The, the frog eyes are the sacro corneae, right? Yes. Hmm. That's not your end point. It's just to help you to identify yeah. the entrance of the uh, of the ischiatic uh, of the of the hole in the in the sacrum, so it's just to help you. What you really want to do is put your probe not in the transverse position to see the frog eyes, but put it in the longitudinal position to see the endpoint of the sacrum and see the slope down of your uh, coccygeal sacral membrane, which yeah. you, you need to perforate with your needle. If you inject through that membrane, or you put your needle through that membrane, just inside, that's far enough, and you can start your injection for your caudal for your caudal block. So what you really want to identify is this sacrococcial membrane and the epidural space. So this, if you can't find frog eyes or anything, it's just to help you in a transverse position, and then you change to the to the longitudinal position. So if you can't find them. Leave them, skip them. There's not, they are not your endpoint. I completely agree, and and uh, yeah, we 
usually even skip that first bit and just do it in plane as you as you describe so that you can see the membrane and your needle in the canal and um yeah i agree the, the frog's eyes is a, is an option um pro- probably if you are gaining experience but for the experienced operator we probably don't even do that okay so maybe there's only the question so Maybe this is the uh, so uh, here in Indonesia. Uh, uh, I have a, one question, maybe the last one. Since our pediatric uh, surgical cases mostly consist uh, like um, in pediatric is like appendectomy or urological cases like hypospadia, orchidopexy, or circumcision or some kind of uh, orthopedic cases like leg fractures. Uh, would you agree, uh, Dr. Luke or Dr. Philip Park, that I can say that caudal block nowadays is still uh, superior or not superior. It's still very important component of the pediatric anesthesia, regional anesthesia in pediatrics. Uh, in uh, if we compare it with the peripheral nerve block, it's easy way, the easiest regional anesthesia block, the maybe the safest, uh, uh, not need the ultrasound, or, or I think the caudal block is very very easy to perform in pediatric cases. Any comments? I agree that the caudal block is still very important in our daily practice in pediatrics. Definitely. Yes, Christopher, I I know what you're trying to say. Uh, 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 Caudal caudal blocks are probably what separates pediatric anaesthetists from adult anaesthetists. I think it's one of those things in our armamentarium that the adult anaesthetists don't have. We still use them a lot. I think we're we're mindful of the risks and the and the complications with them, but for lower abdominal, lower limb procedures in especially children under three years of age, which is a huge percentage of our children, they are a, a gold standard um, local anaesthetic block. In in good hands, they nearly always work. Um, but I would also add to support Luke's arguments and Luke's talk. The, the difference, I, I think the main difference between pediatric anesthesia and adult anesthesia is we always try to supplement the general anesthetic with some sort of local anesthetic technique. Children prefer to wake up with no pain that is numbness. Whereas, and so whether it's a caudal, whether it's an ilioinguinal, um, you know, children benefit from local anesthetic use and, um, and, and caudals are a big part of that. It's interesting, and we've seen a demise in our caudal use a little bit because we don't routinely do circumcisions anymore. Circumcision used to be our commonest indication for a caudal block because they were done very commonly in that newborn period in the first two years of life, and our numbers have plummeted in the last 10 years for good reason. We don't need to do circumcisions, Um, but that, that saw our caudal numbers for our consultants, for our trainees, drop dramatically, but they haven't disappeared and they won't disappear and caudals will remain a very useful practical technique in children. To add something extra, and of course, we still all uh, should search for the new ways of helping our patients. So the new blocks, I I do agree that we should use them and test them and try them to see if they are better, yes or no, but finally maybe they are not, and then you have to leave them again. And then you come back to the older techniques, which are not um, overtaken uh, by the new ones. If uh, I showed you some articles about things that you could do for an interviewing wheel hernia repair, we all know that, yeah, a retro, uh, uh, retrolaminaire block will function, but also an epidural will function. Are we doing epidurals for interviewing wheel hernia repair? Doesn't make sense. You understand what I mean? So we okay. should keep in our minds what makes sense. And some things really do matter. And if not, we go back to the technique we have. And that's the caudal block. 
And we just did more and more investigations and we saw more and more that it is a good block, it is safe, and that the safety um, aspects, as Suraj wrote, was not his barrier for doing the caudal. And that I think is very important in our daily work. Okay, I think this is the last. Thank you very much, Dr. Luke and Dr. Philip for your time. Thank you also for the participants who stay until the last moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope today we gain new insight that will benefit for our daily practice. It has been my pleasure to host this event. So now I will give it the, the session to Krisha. Thank you, Dr. Susilo, Dr. Eddy. And thank you, Dr. Christopher, for leading the discussion. Uh, once again, thank you, Luke. Thank you, Phil. Uh, it's very nice thank to you. see you. I think, Luke, it's uh, early, very early in the morning <laughs> at your time, at your place. Oh, and uh, Philip, I think it's very late in the evening. Thank you very much for spending time with Indo Anastasia. Hopefully, um, who knows next year, uh, we all can be together in Indonesia uh, having the offline meeting, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank and you, Chris. And, and could I just say, Yes. Whatever Dr. Cecilio and Dr. Eddie are drinking, I want some because they look younger than last time I saw them. <laughs> I you agree. guys look fantastic. I want to. I want Lo to. Lovely to see you. <laughs> yes. thank you. Lovely to see you as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.